Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming and some more Baldur's Gate 3. Today I have a bit more of a fun discussion, a look back at the legendary weapons of this game. This is still a subjective look and take on these weapons though. All these weapons are going to do great when paired with the build that's kind of planned or designed around them. So when we compare these legendary weapons to one another, how universally good are they and how good are they for their specific builds? So here's our list. As you can see, we have S through to D just because one weapon kind of stands out as maybe the weakest legendary of all of them. We're going to start from the bottom and work our way up. And first in D tier then is the only legendary weapon in D tier. It's Saloon Spear of Night. Not necessarily a bad weapon. None of these weapons are. It's just when compared to the other legendaries, as we'll talk about, and specifically your other spear option in regards to this specific pick, it's just so overshadowed. Not bad though. You gain advantage on wisdom saving throws and perception checks, and you're just going to get dark vision up to 12 meters. That's very helpful. It comes with Moonbeam, a level three evocation spell that you can use once per day, which is a fine spell. It's just, it requires concentration, which certainly is a problem. Depending on the build you're using, you're probably going to be using concentration for better purposes. The other one is Moonmo. This is a bit more interesting. You illuminate the area with these wisps, making movement difficult for enemies and even bolstering your allies' damage. At the start of their turn, each hostile creature within that light must succeed a wisdom saving throw or they end up dealing with difficult terrain. Meanwhile, each ally within that light deals an extra one to four radiant damage on hit with melee attacks. And this is also 10 turns. The problem here is again, it's a concentration. So you're just not really gonna be using Moonbeam when Moon Mo is just significantly more relevant. And that's it. You know, the weapon doesn't come with any unique proficiency, those special attacks tied to the weapon. On the bright side, it's a bit more universal as a spear because, you know, different types of builds can use this compared to the other spear, but it doesn't have any oomph. And the fact that it's concentration on those two actions that it gets, it's a big problem. So that brings us up a tier to see what we have the Shah's Spear of Evening. It comes with a powerful passive, which means immunity to blindness and multiple actions that are interesting here like Shard's Blessing. You gain advantage on saving throws while lightly or heavily obscured and the weapon deals extra damage or 1d6 of damage to creatures that are lightly or heavily obscured themselves. So you want to be in a cloud and the enemies to be in that too. Fortunately the other action it gives you is a cloud. Shah's Darkness. Create a dark shroud that heavily obscures and blinds the creatures within. Creatures cannot make ranged attacks into or out of it, so that's really good, especially when dealing with ranged enemies. So just that concept is very strong. You're probably going to need the ability to see through those clouds for your team, so they're not negatively affected by it. If you set up your party to all be basically darkness obscure based builds, then awesome. But that's where it becomes actually quite niche and a problem. If you want to do an obscure build, this is the type of weapon you'd be looking for on one player. Good in its specific niche, but pretty damn demanding in that niche. Next up then in C tier, we have Agith Yankee Greatsword here. We have the Silver Sword of the Astral Plane. By no means is this a bad weapon, and yet we have it in C. That is because of the entire purpose of this blade. It's kind of meant to be wielded by Agith Yankee. It's also a two-hand greatsword, which is generally used with specific builds. So it's a niche inside of a niche, and where you are going to get great value out of this is probably say an Eldritch Knight style build where yes you're a Gith Yankee. So basically because it's a Githborn weapon you get an extra 1d6 of psychic damage whenever you attack. That's brilliant. Also a Gith Yankee holding this weapon just has advantage on intelligence, wisdom, charisma saving throws, resistance to psychic damage and also can't be charmed. Compared to not being a Gith Yankee it's just a fine weapon with a neat weapon action. That weapon action being Soul Breaker which rends the enemy's soul and maybe stuns them. You can use that per shot rest. It's a very good weapon action. So I really like this weapon and rate it very high if you specifically are a Gith Yankee who wants to use a two-hand weapon. Fortunately, you can do some awesome builds with, say, Lazel with that, but because of the insane niche nature of all of that, I keep it down in a C. Also down in C here, we have the Devotee's Mace, which is that legendary weapon you get by hitting level 10 on a cleric and then just using your one time per playthrough Divine Intervention, which could be used on much better options. That's certainly not going to save the day spawning in a weapon at that exact moment where you're about to die. It's a commitment to go for this weapon. So how good truly is it? Well, it's a fine one hand mace in general coming with radiant damage sort of inbuilt. If you were to have this in act two, well, that would be absolutely phenomenal, wouldn't it? Only problem, it requires level 10 before you do that. And the chance of you being level 10 in act two, you would have needed to farm some serious XP to make that possible. In act three, the radiant damage is still helpful. I'm not saying it is, 
isn't, but that's where it would have really made the most impact, and you kind of unfortunately miss that. It comes with this special ability, the Healing Incense Aura, where you begin emanating this soothing aura. You and nearby allies gain 1 to 4 hit points at the start of your turn. You can use that once per long rest as a bonus action, which is pretty decent. So once per day in one of those fights you're dealing with, you just have extra healing every time it becomes the wielder's turn. Not massive, but nice. And that's why we keep it in C. But that now brings us to the B tier, where we have first the Blood of Lathander, which might have been the first legendary most of us ever got. Now, compared to the Devotee's Mace, it actually has less damage potential as you're just bonking people with it, because it doesn't have that extra bit of radiant damage on the attacks. However, it gets a lot of extra perks, the main one being Lathander's Blessing. So once per long rest, when your hit points are reduced to zero, you just regain 2d12 of hit points. Also, allies within 9 meters get a nice 1d6 of hit points back too. That is phenomenal in an honor mode run where you have a mechanic once per long rest so it's coming back pretty much every time you need it to save the life of the character that's wielding it. Outside of that it's just one of the earliest legendaries you can get and it's pretty solid the whole way. Having some damage and DPS fall off compared to other weapons as you progress through the axe however which is why it's in B and not higher. Also just passively it generates light that you can turn on and off. Fiends and undead standing in that light become blinded if they fail this constitution saving throw which is pretty handy and it does come with a level 6 evocation spell, Sunbeam, which can be very potent. Again, especially with the fact that you're getting this so early in Act 1. A level 6 level spell, that's incredible. I actually rate it very high because you get it so early, but I rate it lower because it falls off, as I've said. Next up then, we have the duo weapons. We have Bloodthirst and of course the Sword. We have Crimson Mischief. Why I've shown them together in B tier is because there's not really a massive reason to use one or the other. You want to use them in dual wield ideally because of their passives. Let's start with Bloodthirst, which has a unique effect, just like the sword. Whether you're wielding it in the main hand or the off hand, you actually get different bonuses. In the main hand, you get exploit weakness. Creatures hit with this weapon receive vulnerability to piercing damage, which is double damage from then on. But if it's in the off hand, you get true strike repost. When a creature misses you with a melee, you get to retaliate and even gain true strike, which is pretty helpful. There's this inherent passive on the weapon that's amazing though. The number you need to roll a critical hit is reduced by one. If you were a fighter, you'd have to go into champion to get that normally, but the effect can stack, so you might do like a fighter, dual wielding champion build, that's possible. On the other hand, we have Crimson Mischief, which deals necrotic and piercing damage, although that's conditional. It comes with Prey Upon the Weak, dealing that piercing damage against targets that are below 50% of their hit points. In main hand, when you make an attack with advantage, the target takes an extra 7 piercing damage. Whereas off hand, when you make an attack with your off hand weapon, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the attack. So you're guaranteed to get this piercing effect when they're low, and that can be pretty relevant if you're using it in the main hand. But I actually think maybe it should be better in the off hand, because you get that ability modifier added to the damage of the attack, and that means you've got the dagger in the main hand causing exploit weakness, doubling the damage of that piercing damage you're dealing to the targets when they're below 50. So any wounded creature, you finish really well like that. Unfortunately, the nature of these weapons means they're best used together. Dual wielding in Baldur's Gate 3 is not the best concept, certainly can work, but really the biggest problem is that these weapons come so late and they're the best options you have for that playstyle. So I think B tier feels fair on this one. All right, so that brings us to A tier where I have just one legendary weapon. That is the Duelist Prerogative. I really like this weapon, but there is a reason it's not an S tier. So basically you've got this incredible one hand rapier style playstyle. It's this piercing weapon that actually comes with a little bit of necrotic damage as you attack, which is nice, and it can only be used in the main hand. The main passive Elegant Duelist means while your off hand is empty, you score a critical hit when rolling a 19. So you basically wanna use this without something in the other hand. Also, you just get an extra reaction per turn. That's pretty important because on hit with a melee weapon with Withering Cut, you get to spend a reaction to deal additional necrotic damage. So you basically get two reactions and get to spend one every turn every time you attack for a little bit of extra damage. It also comes with challenge to duel and jeweler's enthusiasm. So when you're not dual wielding, you get to make an additional melee attack with the jeweler. So it really wants you to force people to duel and to punish them aggressively with that effect. That leads to what is great for a specific playstyle where this works for you. I did an assassin build with this and that was really fun. They obviously designed this weapon to make sure that Will has an awesome legendary to get. But it does actually have 
other surprising benefits. For example, one of the strongest builds in the game, especially when we think about honor mode, is the Arcane Ward Wizard build, where you're stacking up loads of stacks of Arcane Ward so that you're massively reducing or nullifying enemy damage. Those that attack you, you can reaction punish. By using this weapon then, you'll have an extra reaction to do more punishes. So it's actually quite relevant for one of the strongest builds that are available. That's why I think it deserves to be an A tier rather than a B tier, because it's really good for the niche builds that it's relevant to, but it's also very relevant in one of the better builds you can pick in the entire game. And that really pushes it over the edge for me. But now we get into the good stuff, the S tier, where you probably expected this one, the legendary staff, Marco Heshkir. Pretty much used by every damn caster as soon as it's available in Act 3. It comes with Arcane Battery, it's not the only staff that does, but you don't see this kind of effect until Act 3 either way, so that you can get an extra cast of even a level 6 spell slot if you want. The weapon comes with Arcane Enchantment, a plus 1 bonus to spell save DC and spell attack rolls. That is absolutely phenomenal for any spellcaster. And it does have a unique kind of weapon effect, Koreska's Favor. You get a lineup of different element picks, getting different spells from those, coming in clutch when you're low on spell slots, or just making the most of your turns. More importantly, it provides you resistance to that element though. So irrelevant of the perks of the spells, if you're dealing with a frost enemy, you can make yourself very resistant to that type of damage, resulting in a quite survivable caster. And you get a damage bonus to the spells of those elements, which is pretty incredible. So I think it's fair to say that any caster is going to be looking at this legendary and wanting it. That is what makes an S tier legendary in my opinion. Which is also what I could say for say the Balderon's Giant Slayer, which is absolutely incredible, especially against big enemies. It's just a very good great sword that comes with Giant Slayer, doubling the damage from your strength modifier. It also has advantage on attack rolls if you're dealing with large, huge, or gargantuan creatures, which you can become using its special class action, Giant Form. Once per short rest, you can basically make yourself huge, making your weapons deal an extra 1d6 of damage, and get 27 temporary hit points, which is certainly a lot. Plus, advantage on strength checks and saving throws. Every short rest, every fight, you want to be a giant. Also, it comes with a weapon attack, topple the big folk, deal additional damage equal to your proficiency bonus, and then against those large targets, they take extra damage, 2 to 12, and then they have to succeed a saving throw not to be knocked prone. You can use that every short rest, so you probably use it damn near every fight. I feel that this is a universally good weapon if you are using two-handed weapons of any kind. Giant form absolutely carrying with the temporary hit points it provides and extra damage, as well as the double the damage from your strength modifier that this weapon just provides. It's very good at what it does to a pretty universal level. Next up, we have the legendary bow, Gontir Male, which is just a very solid bow when you look at it, but it's the special effects of its abilities and such where it really becomes relevant. So on hit, you possibly inflict Guiding Bolt on targets. The spell itself is normally a level 1 evocation spell that deals radiant damage, but it means your attack rolls on that target have advantage for two turns. So once that occurs, you get advantage, you're more likely to land your hits pretty much for the whole fight. That is incredible on its own. But then it comes with Celestial Haste, which is argued to be better than a normal haste. It's only a 5 turn haste compared to the 10 turn normal haste, but you don't get lethargic at the end. So Celestial Haste is pretty much a guarantee, put it on every time, immediately. On top of that though, it has the Bolt of Celestial Light, dealing extra radiant damage as you attack, frightening enemies, which means you get advantage, and they have disadvantage, but then following attacks after you've hit them with the Bolt means an extra 1d4 of radiant damage from then on. So pretty much to open a fight, you want to hit them with the Bolt as soon as possible and apply the Celestial Haste every time before going ham on targets. We talked about a very strong build recently using this bow, a Hunter Ranger using Volley and using Volley multiple times a turn, benefiting from this bow in particular. It is absolutely incredible at what it does and if you're using a bow, I think there's a damn good reason to be using this one in the end game. But this brings us to the last weapon at last. We have Nyrulna, which I originally was going to put at A and then I thought about it and I was like, no, this is incredible. It's a versatile trident, so you can one hand, two hand it, but you're probably going to be two handing it and using it in a thrown build. That is because it comes back to you whenever you throw it and also you can never drop it. You can never be disarmed. When you throw it, it deals extra damage via thunder damage, 3 to 12 in specific, in AoE 6 meters around the target you threw it at. If you're doing a throw build, 
This is the weapon. And you know, Tavern Brawler throwing builds are one of the strongest things you can do in the entire game. Also, it gets Veil of the Wind as a passive, extra movement speed and jump distance, and complete immunity to fall damage. Wonderful. And it has these awesome weapon proficiencies in Zephyr Flash, where you rush forward, maybe hitting bleed on targets for three turns that you go through. You can do that every short rest, so once a fight. It's incredible for getting around a fight because you can move around, do what you're doing, and then flash over somewhere else, really sticking to targets. Then you've got Zephyr Break, which is a sort of thunder push that also possibly knocks enemies off balance. This can be used to send multiple enemies off a ledge and instantly kill them, or peel for your team. A Tavern Brawler throwing build using this then is able to absolutely decimate with damage, have incredible mobility during the fight, and deal extra thunder damage in AoE with their throws. The more I thought about this weapon and that build in particular, the more I realized this has got to be S tier. But yeah, there you have it. That is the legendary weapons and my rating on all of them. Overall, I think if you're doing a specific build for any one of them, you're going to do great. But it's those that really go nuts for their specific build or are more universally good rather than specifically good for, say, that race or that party play style. I hope you can understand my reasoning, but keep in mind, this is subjective. This is just my opinion. For now, though, I've been Hollow, you've been you. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye